and welcome to Money, Me and COVID-19, where we speak with leaders from the world of business, finance, investing and politics to find out what's really going on in this pandemic and how we can prepare ourselves to survive in the short term and hopefully to thrive in the post-COVID world. My guest today describes himself as a lazy entrepreneur and investor who's now earning more working 25 hours a week than he used to working 100 hours a week. And he then uses his spare time to mentor business owners to actually achieve the same in their life. Um, he used to, uh, in fact, he has run 60 businesses since the year 2000. So we'll find out a bit more about that in a moment. And in 2017, he published his first book, Big Ideas for Small Business, which became an Amazon bestseller and has had over 50 five-star reviews. His name is John Lamerton. John, welcome to Money and Me. Ah, thank you very much for having me here, Graham. Now, with all due respect, John, every internet guru from Tim Ferriss downwards says, you know, here's this great lifestyle, work a few hours a week, you know, sit around the pool drinking pina coladas. I spent 40 years hunting for this panacea and never found it. So tell me, how have you achieved it? Oh, it was almost an accident, Graham, because I used to hero worship the Bransons and the sugars of this world. Uh, when I first started my business, that was where I was heading. I wanted a big, big business. I wanted um, a yacht in the harbor. I wanted a supercar in the driveway, a supermodel in the bed, preferably. Um, a skyscraper with my name on the side of it. That was absolutely what I was heading for. And I was chasing that and chasing that. And that's where the the hundred hour weeks came from was chasing this big business that I thought I wanted. And then I had children and that was the game changer for me was, uh, I, I clearly remember um, this would be in 2009. I'm sat in an, in an MOT garage in Plymouth with a three month old baby at home who I absolutely adore. And I'm, I do anything for this child really, really um, enamored with my newfound parenthood. And I'm sat there reading Alan Sugar's autobiography, planning on what Sir Alan is going to do, or Lord Alan as it is now, Lord Sugar, is going to do to help grow this empire so that when Jack was an adult, you know, he would inherit the Lamerton Empire. And then I read this one line in Lord Sugar's book, which said, I wasn't really there much for my kids when they were growing up. And like a hammer to the heart, that was like, oh, hell. I don't want a big business anymore. I just want to be there for my children. I want to be there to do the school runs. I want to be there to um, see them grow up, to visit, you know, to do the assemblies, the sports days, to literally just be there when they need me, to have fun holidays, things like that. And I suddenly, literally overnight, decided I actually want to have this lifestyle business. And you mentioned Tim Ferriss just now. Guess what the first book I picked up after Alan Sugar's autobiography was? It was the four-hour work week. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, that, that, I, again, we do all aspire to it, but, but let, let's just talk a little bit about the before picture, and then we'll go on and talk about how you designed this new life. So when you were working 100 hours a week, what kind of business were you in? So it was a dot-com business. So I was a former civil servant who absolutely hated his job with a passion so much so that I thought, you know what, I'm going to become one of these dot-com millionaires that I'm reading about in the press. Um, just a few problems with that. I, I was flat broke. I had no money whatsoever. Um, I knew nothing about business and I didn't even own a computer. So I got myself a copy of Internet Marketing for Dummies. I borrowed my girlfriend's parents' computer their dial-up free serve internet connection. And through a process of trial and error, I taught myself how to build websites, how to attract traffic to websites, how to get them ranking on. It wasn't even Google. It was pre-Google, AltaVista, Yahoo, um, Ask Jeeves. And I figured out how to monetize this business. So ultimately I kept scaling up and this was a bit of the problem to begin with was I had a lot of success. And the more success I had in those very, very early days of the internet, the more I believed my own hype, the more I thought that I really did have the Midas touch. Um, when Google actually launched in the UK, I could have an idea on the Monday for anything I liked. And this is where the 60 businesses sprang up from. 
is I started selling serviced offices and I started having a directory website for florists throughout the UK. And then I thought, yeah, I could actually sell villa rentals as well. Or I could have a package holiday website for the Algarve and we'll do some live football streaming. And all of a sudden I just collected these little businesses because I thought I had the master stroke. I knew how to get number one on Google for anything I wanted and then monetize it. Yeah. Okay. So, so you start with all those kind of businesses, it builds up and, and you reach this point where you, you read the line in Alan Sugar's book, you're now a parent. Um, it, it's one thing to have that kind of, you know, aha moment, but then to actually implement it and make it happen, you know, that, that's a whole different ball game. So, so what, what did you first do? What was the kind of, you know, the, the design process you went through to get from where you were then to where you wanted to be? So one of the first things I did was uh, sit down over lunch with my business partner, Jason, and explained to him that the, the trajectory we were going on was going to be completely changing. We were doing a 360 uh, or 180, to be more precise. We, we were completely changing direction. And we had a, a quite a large team at the time. So we decided to scale back and we met with the team and said, we're closing down. We had two offices at the time. We said, we're closing down the offices. We are all going to work from home. We're going to do remote working. This is not 2020 with making this decision. This was 2006. (laughs) So we've been fully remote working now since 2006. And we decided that we are going to work a, a lot leaner. And I, one of the big things I decided was actually to scale back what I was doing. So when I was running uh, the package holiday website to the Algarve and the office rentals and all these other businesses. I was also the jack of all trades for all of those businesses. So I did the PR, I did the SEO, I, did, I, I was the marketing department, I was the operations department, I was customer service, and I would just flit from one thing to the next. Mm. And I wasn't effective because although I was working 100 hours a week, most of that work involved me hitting the F5 key to refresh my stats and just say, oh, look, we've made a sale. Let me have a look at what the sale is. Oh, look, an email's come in. And I was flitting from one thing to the next. So actually, the first thing I had to do was subtract. I had to take stuff away. And we've all done the, the Pareto principle, the 80-20 analysis. And having a child forced me to do that because I went through this process and said, okay, I'm going to have roughly 20% of the hours available to me that I've previously had. Um, I agreed with my wife when Jack goes to nursery, I'm going to take him to nursery. I'm going to, I'm going to be daddy daycare every Wednesday. And then I'm going to work nine to three the rest of the week. I'm going to take this day off. I'm not going to work weekends. Those were the rules in order to do that. I've, I haven't got a hundred hours a week anymore. So I had to analyze everything I was doing and say, okay, I can only do 20%. So everyone talks about doing the 80-20. I was forced into doing it, Graham. I had to only do the 20%. So I figured, well, I'll just do the stuff that I know brings in 80% of the money. So I will just focus on SEO. I'll just focus on the marketing. I'll stop refreshing the stats. I'll stop checking my emails seven times an hour. I'll stop dropping in for meetings with people. I'll stop randomly checking my voice back in the day was forums. It was pre Facebook, but I was on forums all day looking for ideas or blog posts. I was doing research and I was wasting so much time. So I had to subtract the 80% that contributed 20% of my success. And I went into that thinking, okay, if I do the 20%, uh, sorry, if I just do the, yeah, if I just do the 20% that gets me 80% of the results, I will have about 80% of my income. That's fine. I can live on that. That's absolutely brilliant. And I think a year later, I looked at my income statement and I would earn 150% of my income <laughs> because I was only focused on the right things. I think there's two really important lessons there. Yeah, what, one is definitely to, to focus on what you're best at and what you and only you can do. Mm. But the other, which I think so many business owners miss, is that your business is meant to serve you. 
Yeah. And so often we end up as slaves to our business, just kind of by accident historically. And that kind of reset, which in your case was triggered by parenthood, I think is a process every business owner should go through. And I think many have actually during COVID-19. They have. Certainly lots of the people we speak to, obviously we mentor ambitious, or we, we coined this phrase, ambitious lifestyle business. And it came around a couple of conversations that I had with um, a couple of the dragons from Dragon's Den, because when I started talking about wanting a lifestyle business, there was a bit of a, a negative connotation around lifestyle business that they weren't real businesses. And it was Doug Richard, former dragon, I think from series two or season three, who said to me, lifestyle businesses are the better businesses because they have bottom, what he called bottom line thinking. He said, the big businesses are all about how much turnover can we get in? The lifestyle businesses are how can we get 50% gross profit on a couple of hundred thousand turnover. And the minute I flipped my thinking to, well, if I had a higher profit margin, I don't need 150 members of staff and a skyscraper with my name on the side. It suddenly became easy because I suddenly thought, well, actually what I need to get where I want to get to is now within touching distance. I'm already 85% of the way there. Whereas previously when I wanted the you know, 12 million pound turnover, or whatever, I was 7% of the way there. And all of a sudden, oh, this is achievable. Um, and I think, yeah, more and more people are seeing that now. Uh, we've just hired, for example, a very good marketing assistant who is only available because he's quite enjoyed working from home during the lockdown for his ex-company. And that company has now said to him, you have to come back in the office. You have to do the 45 minute commute each way. And he doesn't want to do that anymore. He quite enjoys working from home. So we've given him that flexibility, then that option to do so. And I think so many business owners are realizing now, having spent the summer with their families and that little bit of reminder that we are mortal, I think more people are realizing what actually does matter. And it's not how many hours you spend at work. <laughs> okay. So, so, so what, what is now the core of your business that's providing you with this kind of 20%, 80% result? So there's a couple of businesses. We've got a sports betting business which um, kind of generates signups for bookmakers and a membership model. And we've got the business coaching side of things as well. So we, we mentor ambitious lifestyle business owners. So again, business owners who want to make that change and think, okay, I've got at the moment a very big business or not even you know huge businesses, but businesses that are bigger than they need to be and that do not, as you said just now, do not serve that business owner, you, you design the business to serve the business owner, not the other way around. I think a, a core part of this, presumably, must be the, the, the choice of the business you're in. Because, I mean, for example, if you ran a, a gymnasium or a hotel or a restaurant, you know, there's just no way you could do that with 20 hours a week. So uh, I guess part of all this is choosing the kind of business model that lends itself to a part-time commitment. Absolutely. And I think that comes from, again, that conversation I had with Doug that, for me, how do I make any, ambi any, any lifestyle business ambitious? Well, I look for high margin. I look for high recurring revenue. I, ideally, I'd like a, a fixed cost base, you know, like a membership platform where I can have zero or at least very little um, cost of sale. So therefore, any economies of scale that come in mean as I get new members in, as I make more sales, all that revenue drops to that bottom line and everything is focused around bottom line i see so many small businesses that they're chasing the million pound turnover when actually a four hundred thousand pound turnover with a 50 percent gross profit margin would serve them a lot lot better absolutely yes and uh, uh i suppose the only challenge to that is those sorts of businesses tend to be kind of online driven and, and there's i think everyone's belatedly recognizing now even though the internet's been around for 25 years that they need a strong strategic online presence. And of course, um, the beauty of the internet is on the one hand, you know, it levels the playing field, you can all be out there with the big boys. On the other hand, you know, the, the competition and the battle for people's attention is more intensive than ever. So what, what are you finding is working in the way of breaking through all the noise to get to the kind of people you want to get your message to? I think more than anything, it's authenticity. It's having that 
very clear, very concise message about who you are and what you stand for. Um, there is a definite shift to online this year. And I was looking at some numbers on this the other day, and apparently the, the trend to online, uh, obviously a lot of people have been forced into it. And a lot of the, um, dare I say, the online phobic people have been moved to online. And I'm, I'm thinking about my parents here, I'll be honest with you, <laughs> that have been forced to create an online grocery shopping account. Um, I'm picturing my dad at the laptop now, punching his numbers in. Um, those people have been forced online, but the trend is actually looking like it's going to be permanent, that the majority of those people who have been forced online are now realizing the convenience of online. And I think that's going to become a more permanent move. We are going to see more people coming online over the next decade anyway. Um, if you certainly look at it as a worldwide trend, um, what online does is it allows people to actually create that media platform for themselves. Mm. So I'm, I'm a big proponent, again, thinking not big businesses. I'm thinking small businesses. I'm a big, big fan of um, Kevin Kelly and his article, 1000 True Fans. This article basically says you don't need a million likes mm. or subscribers. You need a thousand people who absolutely love you and adore what you do and you know if you were a music artist they would come to every show you do they would buy the cd even if they've already got the digital download they'll buy the t-shirt they will drive 200 miles across the country to see you if you can cultivate and this is almost no matter what sector you're in if you can cultivate 1000 people who absolutely love what you do you can make a very good living yeah absolutely uh um, obviously, you, you have access through your coaching program to, to quite a number of other people's businesses. Mm. Um, for the business owners watching us, what, what would you say are the most common mistakes that you see them making and, and how are you able to help them address those mistakes? I think the most common mistake is almost the opposite of what I said just now about being authentic and about being yourself. So when people come into our world, they often tend to be bland beige vanilla me too companies um we had literally i've got a new client sign up this morning i went to his website i think he runs a marketing company but i'm not totally sure because there was some bland cliche at the top of his um website there was a nice stock image photo and then there was another very very general line underneath with a logo i have no idea what this person does or what he stands for or why I should hand over my money to him. And to, the problem is that's standard for business is, well, actually, let's be really clever and arty about it uh, without thinking, yeah, if I land on a website, the first thing I want to know is, am I in the right place? Is this where I expect to be? Mm -hmm. Secondly, what does this person do? What, what do they do and how can they help me? Oh, do I want to know more about this person? or this service or this product. Um, so I think that that's without a doubt for me, the biggest mistake that most business owners make. And, and, and you've touched a few times on, on, on this word authenticity. How, how, how does somebody go about establishing authenticity online, would you say, in, in, in the 2020 world that we're now living in? It's probably a lot of touch points. Um, I would say if you can nurture people's relationships it used to be um very much online and i was as guilty of this as anybody back in the day of treating people like numbers so i had a visitor from google they came in i sent them off i, I sold them a product that was the end of our relationship i now have relationships with our business coaching clients whereby they've bought my book maybe they bought my book a year ago and they've listened to my podcasts over the last year, we've got 70 episodes of the podcast now, and then they found themselves on my website and there's some articles on there. And then they found themselves subscribing to my emails. And I send out a new email with a new like mini chapter of the book every single week. Now that's all automated now. I, I've done that work. That's all there, that's, that's automated. These people now come into my world and they discover me. They discover these little nuances. They know that I'm a Plymouth Argyle fan. They know that I play golf very, very badly. They know that I love cake more than anything else. And these people discover it week by week, episode by episode, a little tiny fragment 
of what makes me tick. And then when I open the doors for a sale, let's say we open the doors to our, our co business coaching club, all of a sudden I get people coming to me saying, John, can I give you some money? And I go, oh, hi, nice to meet you. Um, oh, well, I've, I know all about you, John, because I've, been, I've listened to 57 of your podcasts. I've read all your books. I've subscribed to your emails. This is the first conversation I'm having with people, but they know me inside out. And it is, I think, having that multiple touch points, multiple media, but also being that little bit vulnerable that um, you, know, you, may, you don't need the pinstripe suit and the polished um, pitch to actually connect with somebody. You need, and this is where I think COVID has been a real leveler is when we saw the, t the big Hollywood TV stars at home with their kids walking in the background and just in a normal house. And, oh my God, they're human too. Mm. And we as business owners need to realize that we are human. Our prospects are human. Let's have a human to human conversation. Absolutely. But I think what, one of the things that uh, people have to recognize, and I, I speak from certainly my own experience here, that it's a lot of work and it takes a long time and you've got to put in the hard yards for a, quite a chunky period of time. I, mean, I think I'm up to, this is my seventh year on YouTube, I think, you know, yeah. a, a video a week for seven years. I mean, that's, you know, that's a chunk of work. So, and you won't get instant payback. You've got to recognize this is a process, you're probably talking at least six months before you start to see some traction from it. Would you agree? Oh, easily, at least. Um, I am think I'm three years into uh, my weekly email journey now. So there are many, many people, you know, if you just sign up for my emails today, then you're going to get email one. There are at least 700 emails <laughs> to come um but you know you, you're going to work your way through them and some people will never reach the end of that sequence but there are people who have opened all 700 emails and just like yourself Graham, there will be people who have started their journey with you seven years ago on youtube who mm. follow every single word that you put out because they're one of your 1000 true fans no, absolutely. That's right. So, I mean, your, your new book is um, uh, called Routine Machine. And of course, uh, the name alone implies that there's something about daily habits. We've all got the same number of hours. So what, what, how is it you think we should be using them to get uh, the maximum out of every day? Well, I think I discovered this a few years ago. Somebody, I was being interviewed for the first book and somebody, we went through, you know, what do you do in the mornings? What's, what's helped? What's moved the needle for you? And this host said to me, do you know what, John, I think routine has been key for you. And I went back to my coaching clients and told them this. I'm like, yeah, we all, everybody's known this for a long, long time that you're a bit, well, my wife calls me a routine freak, which is, you know, it's not nice, but you know, I prefer a routine machine. But I, I've always said from that very first day when I did trial and error, internet marketing for dummies, I'm a student of what works. And what I've done with my routines is I've outsourced all that success that I want to have to the routines that work. So actually where I know sending a weekly email works, well, let me create a routine so that I don't need to remember to send a weekly email. Let's create a system here whereby you can automatically get an email every week. Um, I think one of, the, one of the first things I started with, with with routines is just noticing what routines you already have and then thinking, okay, how could I improve that one routine or these handful of routines, whether that's health, diet, investing, um, business ethos, marketing, they, there are certain things that you do every day without thinking about it. So let's just step aside, notice what we do automatically, adapt and improvise and improve those routines and then stitch them back together again because it does have a disproportionate effect when you're suddenly not using any cognitive effort to make wise decisions um, based on stuff that you know works because you've done it in the past. Okay. Now you talk there about being, being a student. I mean, who, who would you point to as being the, the mentors that have helped you the most on your journey and, 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 and why would that be? I think Tim Ferriss is a big one. Um, probably Robert Kiyosaki was the, my first introduction. Um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I, I love that book. I think I've, <laughs> I've read that book. I was going to say eight times, but I've actually, I started, we, we started homeschooling our children last year. So they've been learning rich dad, poor dad. Um, so Harry, my youngest is eight years old 
and she knows the difference between an asset and a liability. Um, so it's, it's been a huge influence to me, but um, I'm influenced by so many people and I think I'm reticent to have one or two go-to gurus, if you see what I mean, when, you know, I'm looking at, I'm just been looking at the books behind you as you're talking there, trying to figure out which ones I've read too, because I just have so many people out there who have followed the blueprint that I want to follow. Um, so I think, yeah, lifestyle wise, I think you can't go wrong with Mr. Ferris. Um, mm. He does ultimately design everything around how do I make my life better? Um, he, he talks about investment in those terms. Um, you know, the, the only reason you invest anything is to make your life better. There is no reason other to do it. If you want more money, well, that's so that you can spend that money on something that is going to make you feel better. It's going to make you happier. It's going to make you healthier. Um, you're doing it to improve your life. No, absolutely. And I suppose the other thing that's kind of crept into the business lexicon in, in recent times is, is more about uh, having a purpose or a mission in your business. So would, would you say that you're, you're driven by a, a mission in what you do? I've, I've always struggled with this because I, we used to have a, a common mentor several years ago who used to talk about, you know, it's very important to have your mission. You've got to know your why. Simon Sinek says, you know, you start with why. It's, you know, people don't buy you what you do. They buy why you do it. I thought I haven't really got that. Um, but I have personally, I don't have this big, uh, well, I, I suppose I do. Lifestyle businesses is my big banner. Stick it in the ground, stick a flag in the ground. I will stand behind that. But for me, I've got a personal mantra and it comes back to that day sat in the MOT garage reading Lord Sugar's book because I went back and I rewrote my, my job description. Um, I've been running business for like nearly 10 years at this point. I didn't need to write a job description, but I thought, actually, do you know what? I need to do this. Mm. So I wrote down, you know, what is my ideal job? What, if I was to write a job description, what would I actually want to do? So I wrote down and I live by this mantra now. So my ideal job description is to do what I want, when I want, how I want, where I want, if I want. And everything's got to go through that filter now. Mm, okay, that's fascinating. Yeah. <clears throat> Most of the people I speak to on this program have had to face enormous changes during the, the pandemic. But from what you're telling me about the way you've designed your life back in sort of 10, 15 years ago, I'm guessing that you, you've probably almost sailed through this without much change, have you? <laughs> it did feel like that way at times. I have to say, you know, when, when people said, oh my God, this is, this is horrendous. We're, we're having to do remote working. And I'm sat there thinking I've been doing that for 14 years. Um, you know, oh, we need to have Zoom meetings. Okay, we've been using Zoom about two years. Oh no, we've got to homeschool our children. Well, we started doing that last September. So I had the pain, uh, you know, I've still had the pain and upheaval of doing these, these transitions. I just had them a couple of years before everyone else. I, I just like to say I'm ahead of the curve. Mm, okay, <laughs> cool. Um, I think a lot of people might be facing the, the impact of perhaps losing their job during the, the pandemic when the furlough scheme ends. Mm. Therefore, perhaps start to look about you know, setting up a, a business. What would be you know, your advice to somebody that's thinking of going into business for the first time in this climate? What would you kind of suggest that they do and, and what would you suggest that they avoid? Okay. Um, first thing I would say is it's a fantastic time to start your own business. There are so many business owners I know and speaking of clients and personal friends who were forced into starting their business because they were made redundant. Uh, the civil service, my dream job that I really enjoyed was taken away from me. My hand was forced. So it really hurts and it really does when you lose your job. But often these things do happen for a reason. In terms of getting started, start small. Don't look at Lord Sugar. Don't look at Richard Branson. And think, I need to do that. Think, okay, businesses exist for one reason only. Businesses exist to solve problems. So can you solve a problem for one person and convince that one person to part with money in order for you solving their problem? If you can, great. You've potentially got a business. Obviously, if, this, if you can only solve it for one person, you may not have a business unless that one person is an oligarch. So we then look at scaling up from there. So then we look at, okay, let's build an email list. Let's build a social media following. Let's start collecting those thousand true fans. 
But before we worry about a thousand true fans, let's get one. Uh, and let's prove the model. Um, who is it? The um, lean startup guy who says, you know, get the minimum viable product out there. That's a fancy way of saying get somebody to give you some money who isn't friends or family. <laughs> you know, persuading your mum to let you, you know, wash her car at the weekend is not a business. Mm. Um, convincing a stranger to part with £25 for a service or a product is. So let's, let's start small. Okay, great. Well, as, as we come to the end of our, of our time together, John, I, I want to just give you a quick uh, career change opportunity and, and, and suggest that there's been a, a cabinet reshuffle and the new uh, Chancellor of the Exchequer has been announced as Mr. John Lamater. Um, so in your, your first hundred days in office, uh, with all your business experience and knowing what businesses need, what changes would you make if you were in that position in number 11 Downing Street? Oh, well, so the first thing I think I would do is, well, I'm, I'm sure you will have heard this many, many times. I would simplify the tax code. I would make it really, really easy for all, bin, all business owners, all entrepreneurs, all wealth generators and creators to pay tax. And the easiest way for them to pay tax is to know what it's going to cost them. And so whether that is, you know, I, I don't want to go into sort of flat rates or, you know, high rate, lower rate, whatever, but Ultimately, if I can make it simpler, then there's less legal loopholes to jump through. There's less outrage when big corporations take, um, take advantage of the rules. And I would absolutely just make it really, really easy for me as a business owner to A, generate wealth, and then to B, pay my fair share of it. Fantastic. Okay, well, you'll certainly get my vote. John Lamberton, thank you very much for joining. Thank you, Graham. 